us. Uh, good afternoon. I'm Stephen Pfeiffer. I'm a William Perry Research Fellow at Stanford Center for International Security and Cooperation. And I will be introducing and then uh, emceeing uh, today's discussion of the European Security Initiative on the Russian military threat to Ukraine. Over the past two to three months, we've seen the Russian military make a substantial buildup on or near Ukraine's borders, and that's generated something of a crisis atmosphere in Europe. We did see something similar to this Russian buildup back in April, uh, but that really led nothing, nothing happened. But since then, you've seen further deterioration in the relationship between Moscow and Kyiv. On the Russian side, in July, Russian President Vladimir Putin published a lengthy five to 6,000 word essay in which he all but denied Ukraine the right to exist as a sovereign and independent state. In October, former Russian President Dmitry Medvedev called further negotiations with Kyiv pointless. And on the Ukrainian side, what you've seen over the last several months is an increasing push from President Zelensky and for other senior Ukraine officials for a definitive path for Ukraine into NATO. Uh, for their point, American officials and European officials have expressed far more alarm about this current Russian buildup and what it might mean than was the case last spring. And at this point, it's really not clear what President Putin and the Kremlin intend to do. And it may well be that Mr. Putin is not yet decided. Part of that decision could depend on negotiations on talks that have taken place this week, US-Russian talks in Geneva on, Jan on Monday. Uh, today, there was a meeting of the NATO-Russia Council. And tomorrow, there'll be a meeting of the Organization of Security and Cooperation in Europe. But however the Kremlin decides to proceed, it's very clear that Russia is putting in place the preparations for what could be major military operations against Ukraine should it decide to do so. So I'm delighted that we have today uh, Michael Kaufman to talk to us about these issues. He is the research program director in, Russian, in the Russian Studies Program at CNA, which I believe was former the Center for Na Naval Analysis. Uh, he's also a fellow at the Kennan Institute at the Woodrow Wilson Center in Washington. And his focus is Russia and the post-Soviet space, in particular armed forces, military thought and military strategy. And previously he was a program manager at the National Defense University, where he was able to engage on these issues with senior defense department and other US government officials. And uh, he's going to help us understand what is the reality of the Russian buildup? What's the ground truth? What kinds of military options this will give the Kremlin should it decide to act? And then how might a conflict between Russia and Ukraine play out? So we're going to be talking very much about possible war scenarios today and trying to understand you know, what could happen uh, and uh, hopefully will not happen, but it is still, I think at this point, uh, a hypothetical, but certainly not a prospect to be dismissed. After the opening comments, uh, we'll have plenty of time for questions. Please submit your questions on the Q&A function, not on the chat function, function. The chat function has been disabled and we'll try to get to as many of your questions as we can. Uh, Michael, thanks for joining us. Uh, the floor is yours. Okay, well, thanks for that kind introduction. Um, I guess what I'll begin by saying is, as many of you might recognize, there's a fair bit of uncertainty about Russia's intentions. Uh, people have staked out different analytical positions on this question, and military posture rarely lends itself to any one single specific interpretation. It creates a range of options. What the Russian military buildup does tell us overall is that Russia's political leadership has directed the armed forces to prepare for a large scale military contingency in Ukraine and to make a military operation a viable option. That is about as much as we can really glean about intentions. Personally, I will say just up front that I am pessimistic and I have been from the very beginning of this crisis. And I suspect that uh, Russia may have made a decision in principle, but not necessarily committed to it. And I'm skeptical about the black effort. That's just to express my own confirmation bias and, and a bit where I come at these questions. But let me focus on the military side. To do that, uh, I'm going to unfortunately throw a couple of bunch of numbers at you that I hope actually will be useful for those interested in the subject. I'm going to borrow from a good recent New York Times article that used the data of a colleague of mine, Conrad Muzica, with whom I work with quite a bit. It's, it's a graphic that New York Times used, but it's his his data, and I think he, he worked extensively on it. And I'll just put that up. And the point is to have a map so that there's something good to look at, right? Uh, and something useful to consider while, while I talk about. So give me one second. I'll share that. You probably read this article already and you're familiar with this, but nonetheless. Okay. So 
So if I'm if I'm right, you're looking at a map right now. Okay, good. Great. All right. So first, understanding Russian military deployments and how to think about the buildup. Every media outlet that I've seen cover the story for the last three months has a good part of the story right and some part of the story wrong. So I'm going to try to unpack this uh, today. And I'm going to use ballpark figures. When I say near or around Ukraine, I'm using roughly a 250 kilometer radius as a marker, right? When we say near or around Ukraine, we have to actually indicate what we're suggesting. And later on in the talk, I'll, I'll probably mention as to why that's a useful range to, to look at. The Russian military has roughly 55,000 may, or maybe 60,000 ground troops that are permanently stationed on the Ukrainian border. Many are divisions that have been moved in recent years or newly created formations since 2014. This amounts to about 30 battalion tactical groups. A battalion tactical group is a task organized combined arms maneuver formation. It averages around 800 personnel per unit. Basically, it is a battalion with supporting units and formations. The actual structure can vary quite a bit. Russia has gathered an additional 30 battalion tactical groups from distant formations across the country, from the Caucasus, St. Petersburg region, Moscow general region, across central Russia, and now the Russian Far East, all right? The total now stands at around 60 battalion tactical groups. That represents roughly 35% of the available BTGs across the Russia ground forces. These are ballpark figures. The Eastern Military District, all right, has sent several units which have yet to arrive. They are on the railroad right now. That's going to drive this figure considerably northward, depending on how much they sent. From the looks of it, all four armies in the Eastern Military District have sent troops. And as you know, Russia is the biggest country on earth, so it takes a while to get somewhere, but they are going to eventually get somewhere in the Western Military District. Russian offensive maneuver units in the area have therefore been increased by around 100%. They can be estimated anywhere between 36,000 to 48,000 troops with a total force, force package of over 85,000. That doesn't include air power. It doesn't include naval units. It doesn't include logistical components that are likely to show up to support the force. Important point, most of the BTGs these units sent are pre-positioned equipment without troops. I'm gonna talk about that in a bit. So we are assuming the personnel that will arrive to use this gear if they choose to launch a military operation. But what we have is the equipment pre-positioned, okay? Russian-led forces in Ukraine's Donbass region, often referred to as separatist units or whatever you want to call them, might account for another 15,000 troops, okay? But they have much lower military potential. The Ukrainian government usually estimates them at around 30 to 32,000. Uh, I'm gonna tell you that my estimate of the reality of that fighting force is probably less than 50% of that figure. Some government estimates that you see out there include the Russian-led separatist forces, and some do not, which is depending on which government figures you're looking at. So that might explain some of the variability. All right, the force gathered is already sufficient for a military operation. For context, the Russian offensive in August 2014 probably featured only four to six battalion tactical groups and the winter offensive of 2015, maybe eight to 12, right? So when I say 60 already there, that should give you a sense of the force that's already gathered relative to prior military operations. Back then, Russia deployed a sizable level operational formation, meaning it deployed quite a few forces in 2014, 2015, but it committed relatively few units from those forces with devastating effect. The current force of 60 battalion tactical groups that were ballparking is largely within self-deployment range, which means they can self-sufficiently move to the border and disperse. That's why we use a limited range to actually uh, delimit the units we are counting, right? When we say near around Ukraine, there's got to be some kind of range number to that for you to have a sensible conversation of what you're looking at and what you're counting and what really constitutes the building, right? And that's one of the practical reasons for having, for, for having that be a useful number. All right. Russia retains considerable force generation potential, and it can surge units to that area on relatively short notice. There are other formations nearby 
which have not generated units yet, but could, all right? So this force is, as we see right now, sizable, but still a fraction of some of those estimates released in the media, suggesting there's gonna be 100 battalion tactical groups, plus a sizable amount of reserves for a total of 175,000 troops. There are indicators now that Russia is gathering logistical support units, maybe deploying medical equipment, hospitals, and starting to move supporting rotary aviation, basically attack helicopters and the like. So that's uh, the Russian buildup appears to have been taking at a real, taking place at a relatively slow pace. And it's probably shifting the potential window for military operation further to the right. Why is it going slower than some may have anticipated or expected? Honestly, I don't know. And I'll tell you the truth. I always think a good analyst uh, has to admit when they actually don't, don't know what the real reason might be. Uh, I'll tell you, we have zero clarity, I think, for why this says, uh, this buildup is being done so slowly or deliberately. The likely factors could be operational considerations tied to weather, changing timeline because they know that we know, so adjusting their timeline based on the information publicly released by the United States in November and December. But the most likely deciding factor is political. And we can discuss that in Q&A. The, the short answer is that it can, the reasons uh, can, be, can vary uh, and, and we don't know, or at least I don't know. Okay, how to interpret uh, this buildup relative to previous war scares of the one in the spring. So in early 2021, the Russian military deployment was very overt. They visibly sent forces and concentrated them in large numbers of training ranges, and it lasted barely two months. Rather than two separate events, the movement of force in the spring should really be treated as the initial phase of the current buildup. It's all one buildup starting in March of 2021. This is one big affair. It is not actually two separate events. A number of Russian units that were deployed in spring of 2021, most notably 41st Combined Arms, Arms Army from Russia's Central Military District, they never left the area, okay? So the Russian deployment in the fall that we've been observing was much more covert Many units moved around at night with very little public evidence. Uh, and there are other indicators of interest as well. The Russian military has been conducting tests of its new reserve system. It's been showing efforts to train with practical, sort of off tactical adaptations to deal with anti-tank guided missiles. And Russia has been engaged in a systematic campaign to diminish the ability of OSINT researchers to actually follow troop movements in the fall, which they were easily able to do in the spring. And by the way, they made a big mistake in the spring because they revealed a lot of systems that people were using to follow Russian troop movements in the spring. And you know what happens if you reveal methods? Sure enough, by the fall, the Russian military and the Russian FSB made sure that this was not possible to repeat. Mm. So while the military deployment may feel, appear overly visible and kind of lacking initial surprise, in fact, the opposite is true. I want to make this point. I've heard some political analysts say, well, if Russia wanted to do something, it wouldn't be so overt or so visible, it'd be something covert. Uh, that just defies basic military science. In 2021, it's really not possible to move sizable forces without detection by countries with advanced means of national reconnaissance like the United States. Russia is indeed assembling this force in a manner designed to conceal its intentions and the main elements of a potential operation. It retains operational surprise and initiative. The Russian military is deploying the force slowly and deliberately with pre-positioned equipment that can be parked in the field for months. Troops can then be quickly sent to these encampments, fall on equipment, begin dispersing. Russian military has been moving units around uh, throughout the year, cycling them in and out of the area, and then parking military kit in lots of smaller concentration. So this conceals the final disposition of forces, potential timing operation, the potential scope of a military operation, and it leaves a lot to conjecture, right? If you're going to ask, how would you deploy a large force for a military operation while concealing most of the important things observers might want to know, this is a good way to approach that problem. So at this stage, neither United States or European capitals or Ukraine necessarily can know with any certainty when a military operation might take place, what is its likely scope, and wouldn't know until fairly late into Russian preparations, by which point there would be precious little time to react. And Ukraine itself, because of the Russian buildup and how it's done, finds itself in a mobilization trap. 
unable to mobilize too early because of the cost and disruption that it would entail. And that's probably why Ukrainian authorities have been downplaying the situation since October, both to avoid public panic and to prevent calls for mobilization when they don't know the potential timing of you know, a hypothetical Russian attack. And here might also be very reticent to conduct large force shifts and order general mobilization. Because if Russia is actually spoiling for a fight, a mobilization could be used as a pretext by the Russian leadership saying, ah, see, Ukraine intends to retake the Donbass by force. Now Russia sort of uses that as a potential cause of belly to launch a military operation. The point I want to make is that if you look at the way Russia is deploying its forces, it creates a host of dilemmas for Ukraine. Is this deployment sustainable? Well, the most significant constraints of Russian military deployment have to do much more with the disruption it creates to the training and maintenance cycles. Much of the recent buildup is pre-positioned equipment. The personnel remain back in their garrisons. Uh, as a result, you know, um, the deployment faces far fewer cost constraints than it would if Russian military was sending manned formations. And as I explained, a large part of the of the total forces you we're looking at are actually permanent base formations, less than half, already that are garrisoned and based around Ukraine. Okay, but there are not enough challenges in sustaining it. You know, for example, without equipment, troops that remain back at their normal garrisons may not be able to maintain their skills, qualifications, or have the gear to tra train on. Temporarily deployed units that include both equipment and personnel, um, they have a much shorter time horizon before they need to return to their permanent bases. And that's a combination of constraints, you know, conscript rotation, there's a new influx of conscripts that are due to come in April, training schedule, morale issues that could be caused, are likely to be caused by personnel being away from their families for an extended period of time. You might say, okay, most of the equipment's pre-positioned and without personnel, true. But Eastern military district units, for example, are clearly being sent with personnel, right? So that's a story that's likely to change. So it looks like they are increasingly sending battalion tactical groups that are not just equipment, but the actual personnel and battalion with it. Um, okay, so you know the best case assessment we can make, I think, is that um, while some training can be conducted in forward deployed locations, it's pretty limited by the availability by the availability of training facilities, and so the military essentially is willing to take the short term hit, the combat readiness. From disrupted training schedule, but that's going to factor into war planning calculations over time, right? Because you're actually reducing your force readiness, you're reducing your forces likely like actual combat effectiveness the longer you create this disruption if you actually do intend to conduct a military operation. Uh, finally, financial factors are a less significant constraint on the timeline for this deployment. Um, you know, a forward deployment of the size and inevitably brings additional costs, but they're pretty low because this is on Russian territory, most of the units are there without personnel, and the sizable percentage of it is, is permanently based formations annually. It's not to say there isn't any cost, but I, I initially kind of looking at this in the fall, believed that there would be substantial costs associated with it, and this would create real time horizon constraints for how long they could maintain the forces. But now there's much clearer evidence that likely they could sustain this force posture for some time, which could be why they're building up much slower, much more slowly. All right, potential operations, and, and this is kind of the looking through a glass uh, darkly. Um, so the force posture offers a range of options. We can make some base assumptions that this would be a joint force operation involving air power, sea power, the use of artillery fires, long range precision strike systems, and it would likely affect a uh, substantial amount, if not all of Ukraine's territory. I'm very skeptical that the point of Russian military operation would be territorial aggrandizement, but they may actually seriously be considering a partition of Ukraine. I think the worst case scenario is definitely out there. And probably boil down to three potential scenarios, a very limited strike scenario. Uh, strike and air campaign, I think would be inherent in any operation, but the Russian military could see it as a standalone element backed by the threat of a ground campaign that's hoping to coerce Ukraine with just, with just air power and strikes. I think that that's very un uncharacteristic for Russia, which typically uses air power in support of ground operations rather than strategically. And I also think it's very much unlikely to work. 
I think uh, the most likely option is a large scale military operation that essentially involves a multi axis attack whose purpose is to destroy Ukraine's military potential and compel a political settlement. I think uh, all analogies are imperfect, but the Russia Georgia war might be one example. And that would involve holding territory for some time to secure ground lines of communications. And it might even involve uh, encirclement of major cities like Kiev or an operation along Ukraine's southern coast. Uh, or it could be just limited to Ukraine's eastern regions. By that, I mean the parts of Ukraine east of the Dnieper River. Uh, I think it's very important to reflect on the fact that a great deal is contingent on the war. And it's very difficult to predict what's actually going to happen beyond the first move in any military campaign. Russia may easily uh, conduct an operation or, or plan to conduct an operation not intending a prolonged occupation, but then end up being stuck holding territory. A good example of that is actually uh, the Russian occupation of the Donbass. This is why they may be preparing a fairly sizable reserve force and signaling that they are going to prepare a large follow-on force so that they have options in case things don't go the way they expect. Worst case scenario is an actual seizure of Ukraine's eastern region, southern coast, and then uh, setting up some alternative pro-Russian government, essentially a partition of Ukraine. I see the other much more limited options as very unlikely or deeply impractical, either because it can't discern any political objective they would serve, or because the costs of those uh, more limited types of operations would actually be much higher. Uh, those interested are welcome to ask in Q&A, why would Russia not attempt a land bridge to Crimea or a limited seizure of another territory like Kharkiv or an expansion of the fight in the Donbass or anything else? I just, in the interest of time, I'm not going to address, you know, I can't address literally everything um, in my opening comments. A couple of big caveats on analyzing possibilities, costs, and risks. So first, you know, militaries really come to different conclusions about the military balance, the potential costs, or the risk involved in an operation. The only thing you can safely bet on is that the Russian military perspective is probably different than yours or than ours, right? Military establishments do actually see the implications of capabilities, the strength of another military, the military balance very differently. They're both looking at the same picture, but they're seeing different things. And of course, what matters is not what we think, but how the Russian military sees the situation. And as a second point, I think more important, the local leaders are informed by military thinking, but they have an entirely different calculus and set of considerations that shape their thinking. Military analysts who imagine that the local leaders make decisions based on military realities, often, if not almost always, are gonna get it wrong. The local leaders can easily suffer from more optimism or more pessimism, or a host of assumptions that leads them to conclude that the cost of a conflict will be low, that it won't be a long fight, that the war will be short, even if the military tells them that this might not be the case. And even if the military gives them fairly prudent advice, it happens in this country, it happens almost anywhere else. So just to be clear on that. So whenever folks say that surely either the Russian military must count the same way do, do the same way that we do, I can tell you they don't. And surely that Vladimir Putin in Moscow would understand that this and that would happen, I could tell you that's probably a very deep mirror imaging mistake. Uh, last few points here regarding the Ukrainian military. And here I'll admit, I know the least. Actually, somewhat ironic, I think we, I think analytically, we know a lot more about Russian military potential than we know about that of Ukraine's military. And there are a number of reasons for that. And, and it's probably even, e even easier to estimate better what the Russian military might see as a viable operation than what the Ukrainian military might do in defense. I'm going to make a couple of very general broad brush points here. First, it is safe to say that Ukraine's military is outmatched qualitatively and quantitatively by the Russian armed forces. Um, second, the Ukrainian military has fixed a number of tactical gaps and problems it has had since 2014 but it retains major structural deficits. Everything from air defense to logistics, ammunition, mobility, quality of reserves, manning rates, and, and most of the deficits are more at the operational strategic level of war. Uh, I don't know what the Ukrainian military intends to do. And this is why 
any predictions of what might happen in the war between Russia and Ukraine are highly contingent. They're not only contingent on what Russia does, but they're very contingent on what Ukraine chooses to do, right? So you're dealing with two variables that you don't have good visibility or clarity on. I think if I was to make an educated guess, because the Ukrainian military in a larger operation would inherently face the risk of being encircled and cut off, it would have to make hard choices and most likely fight an organized retreat. Um, the only other point I would make in this regard is that it's true across the board that the Ukrainian military has gotten much better since 2014. What is often not mentioned in the same sentence that the Russian military has also gotten tremendously better since 2014. It is a force at a very different level in terms of structure, capability, level of training. It's been bloody a number of conflicts. It too has improved considerably. How these two armies match up, unfortunately, uh, military power really needs a context to express itself. So it is very, very hard to war game this out on somebody's pocket pick. Okay, with that unsatisfactory answer, uh, I'm gonna turn this back over to Steve who kindly invited me to this conversation. I'll stop sharing the map, although I'm happy to bring it back up if, if it's useful to, to one of the questions asked and, uh, and, and turn it back over for QA. Michael, thank you very much for that introduction. And uh, yeah, you threw a lot of numbers out there, but I actually feel uh, you know, I have a much better sense for what this buildup that we read about every day in the newspaper it entails. Let me ask a couple of questions. Uh, you know, one would be sustainment. Uh, I mean, I assume that particularly when the Russians have troops in the field along with the equipment, you know, that drives costs up. You know, how big of a cost factor that is in addition to the morale questions that you, you raised? All right, so at the stage, they do not have troops in the field with equipment, but that is likely going to change in the coming days or week because they are increasingly sending equipment with forces. A substantial percentage of what is being counted into this force package, as I said, are actually permanently based formations and they're not away from their bases. That's actually why I think they're able to sustain this deployment and we're doing it much more slowly, right? If you kind of saw the indications of it in very late October, perhaps it's the latest round, um, you can see that they're, they're able to drag this out for quite a few months. If it comes down to uh, building up towards an operation, right? When operation is imminent, then I think the short answer is that the cost will be substantial in terms of disruption. And there are real challenges to deploying a force and having it be actually ready to conduct a military operation, but then just sitting there not doing anything. It's, it's quite bad for morale. There are a lot of challenges that, that uh, begin to emerge from doing that. And so the longer you keep forces pre-positioned for an operation, but don't do anything, the more you actually degrade your own war fighting uh, potential. Okay, so then I should take from that then that once they get this package assembled and, and, and the units from the military district, the Eastern military district arrive, and if they actually get troops out in the field to man the pre-positioned equipment, at that point, there would be an incentive to act sooner than rather than later, correct? Yeah, I would say that would be one of the big indicators that they actually intend to conduct the military offensive. Okay. Let that me, along with others. Yeah. Let me pose a second question, which is, you know, in, in, in some of the commentary in the newspapers, there's this talk about the weather and that there's a certain period now during the winter when the ground is frozen, it makes operations off-road much easier. But by March, April, as anybody who spent time in Russia or Ukraine knows, things in the fields get pretty muddy. Um, how big of a consideration is that for the modern Russian military? Mm, the Russian military is not a seasonal military. It can fight in any month of the year. Okay. So it would be easier to launch an operation during one season versus another, let's say. That's true. Uh, that, of course, also depends on some of the assumptions we're making about the scope of the military operation. But the short answer is they can conduct a military offensive during any time period. I think it would, for a number of reasons, might be um, more easier for them to do in the winter. And it just it doesn't it, it doesn't just have to do with terrain. It can do, deal with foliage cover and all sorts of other factors. 
uh, but they've also conducted offensive in the summer in August too. So the truth is that we should not think of this in World War II terms. I'm always very wary that folks like kind of have impressions from World War II and are transposing them onto Russian armed forces in 2021. Weather terrain is always a factor. It is, but it doesn't mean the Russian military can't conduct an offensive in April or May. Okay. Well, let me go to some of the questions. Um, uh, Catherine Stoner asked the question. First of all, she says great insights, and I think you really have helped us understand the military context here. But what do you think of the possibility of a partisan or guerrilla war should Russia take a substantial portion of territory, either all of Donbass or actually surround uh, Kiev or grab something along the, uh, the uh, southern quarter? I mean, the honest answer is nobody knows. Uh, everybody has kind of their assumptions about Ukraine and sort of projects that into a narrative of whether uh, partisan war is likely or not. I, I can just make maybe offer a couple of data points and, and then folks can do that what they like. So the first is that it is very difficult to predict armed resistance based on polling. That's for sure. Uh, second, we can assume that the likelihood of armed resistance is highest in Western Ukraine, but we don't have much evidence that, Russian, that Russia actually intends to seize Western Ukraine. Third, there really wasn't an insurgency or armed resistance either in Crimea or the eastern half of the Donbass that Russia seized. And you could say, well, that's very because of the particularities of those regions, the political or cultural sentiments in them. That's fine, but I'm just offering that as the only data point we have. Um, the other one is that I just don't know. It's not clear to me necessarily that uh, Ukraine is, uh, or, or at least Eastern Ukraine and Southern Ukraine are ideal environments for a partisan movement, to be perfectly frank. Um, that, that I, I have question marks on that. The short answer is I don't know. The, the last point on that is that uh, it's definitely the one thing that wouldn't deter Russia, because Russia has a very extensive record in counterinsurgency, domestic and foreign, and in crushing partisan movements and insurgencies. And that's probably one aspect of this that, that Russia might not be as deterred as folks in the West think they would be, is by the prospect of a partisan or guerrilla war. In fact, they, they faced one in Ukraine after World War II. Yeah, this has happened before. Okay. All right. Uh, Frank Fukuyama says that he's noticed that some Russian commentators have recently made some military threats against other NATO members. Is there anything that you have seen that suggests military preparations, for example, against the Baltics, or is really the Russian military now focused on the situation in Ukraine? No, it's about Ukraine. But it, it very likely could involve uh, Belarus flank, that is Russian forces using Belarusian territory for a Northwestern vector into Ukraine. But I don't see any threat to the Baltics. Um, I'd be very careful in reading the sort of, uh, you know, panoply of voices from the Russian uh, policy community or people like out of the Duma. They say all sorts of things and they're not reflective of what senior leadership thinks. It's just in an environment like this, you often see that the space gets opened up in Moscow for people to voice these sentiments and they sort of have a license to hunt. And, and voice all sorts of hawkish statements. Okay, that leads into my next question. And first, I'm going to forego all the thank you for the insights and great presentation, but you can assume it's at the lead to most okay. questions. You never know, you're on Zoom and you give people a lot of numbers and you don't know if everybody's dead at the end of that conversation or if they were interested. So I'm, just, I'm, I, I'm I, glad I, to I, hear I, it. So this question comes from uh, Ann Clunan. Um, and uh, she asks, you know, if, if you're looking at the Russian military preparations, two questions. One, what are the two to three indicators that you would say, this means the Russians are really going in? Indicators that also might be visible to us on the outside. And then when you talk about the, all of the voices coming out of Moscow, are there a couple of people that you think we really should be listening to and paying attention to their words? Okay. Um, on the first one, probably the shorthand indicators I would look to would be first key logistics units being moved in place to support the uh, formations currently deployed. That is medical, fuel, ammunition, 
food, the things you would need for an extended military campaign. Caveat, many battalion tactical groups are expected to be self-sufficient for a limited period of time, some number of days logistically. So I always want to put an asterisk there to say, just because they haven't moved those key elements in place doesn't mean the Russian military is actually not in a position to conduct a limited operation already. Second, Russian units are some distance from the Ukrainian border. They will have to pick up all their gear, load them onto flatbeds, drive them to the border, and then unload them and disperse. So that's going to be your 100% indicator that something's likely going to happen. Third, support elements shifting in the last couple of days before the operation from other Russian branches and combat arms. Air power, fixed wing aviation, tactical aviation shifting. Rotor aviation, well, you've seen that in your Times report that they are moving rotor aviation slowly in place, but you would expect to see other elements as well coming in on relatively short notice before an operation. So as I said, you would expect this to be a joint force effort, so you'd expect to see sh big shifts in Russian air power and things like that. Um, on, on who we should listen to, well, that's, uh, okay, well, the banal answer is obviously Vladimir Vladimirovich Putin, who is the ultimate decider on both war and foreign policy in Russia. And most folks in Russia, including uh, those at the highest most circles, don't necessarily know what he's going to decide or what he thinks, as you, as you probably recently heard. I, I will say that um, uh, from my point of view, I, I get much easier to tell you who you shouldn't listen to as opposed to who you should. But I would say uh, Vladimir Putin may be one. Um, Patrushev may be a second person, uh, Nikolai Patrushev. And um, you know, as a third, at the end of the day, Probably those from at the top levels of the Ministry of Defense, like Shoigu. He doesn't say very much, and he doesn't say it very often. He's actually quite useful to listen to on occasion. You get very few statements from Shoigu and very few from Gerasimov. I do recommend listening to them. You're not likely to hear much out of them during this crisis, but when you do, you should pay attention. Let me follow up this one other way. Is there anybody in particular outside of the government, any Russian commentator that you think has this particular insight that we ought to be listening to? You mean in the in a sort of analytical or policy right, wonk right. community in Russia? Now people like Dmitry Trin and those those folks, uh, Lukyanov. Uh... I'm gonna I'm gonna get myself in trouble, but uh, here, but I'm gonna say this: I really uh, respect and I do read. Uh, all my colleagues that um, that engage in policy analysis and political or military analysis in Russia, right? Whether it's Dmitry Trenin or Fyodor Lukyanov um, or Andrei Kartunov and the, and the like. Here's the honest answer. And I really like that Fyodor Lukyanov recently said this, that he doesn't know. They don't know. Here's my view. They have been behind analytically this picture from the very beginning. They didn't know about the military buildup. They didn't expect the political demands. They didn't expect the treaties. They don't necessarily know what's behind it. And they don't know what Vladimir Vladimirovich is thinking in the Kremlin. I'm sorry, I should be very frank about that. I really feel that uh, there was even a week, maybe not a week, sorry, almost an entire month, where a lot of Russian analysts were very silent in late October and November because they had no idea what to make of the news that was coming out. And it was very clear to me. And there was another negative indicator that this was kept very close hold. So at least in, in Russian political circles. That's not a knock against them, by the way. If you're living in a personalized authoritarian system and you don't know what's being thought of at the highest elite levels, it's not a knock against you. But I'm an analyst and I'm typically charged with, with laying out what I see as the objective reality. I don't think they know. Yeah. OK, perfectly fair answer. Uh, David Holloway asked the question, how likely would you see an attack that is aimed simply at destroying the Ukrainian military and then quickly withdrawing as opposed to actually grabbing and holding Ukrainian territory? Well, I laid that out as the middle option, I think is the most likely using the Russia-Georgia war as an analogy. I think it's very likely, it's probably the likeliest of these, um, but 
there are there are challenges with that too um and, and i'm happy to raise the counterpoints right so the first is that it will involve attaining a political settlement the problem with the political settlement is there are a number of people in moscow that don't believe any political settlement with the ukrainian government will be valid that ukraine's not going to implement anything they agree to anyway so it will be the point of a larger war to force them into a third political settlement or ceasefire agreement that they're still not going to implement there's a school of thought like that over it right which means that a compelling campaign only works if you believe that the person you're compelling is going to do the thing you compel them to do if you have a lot of evidence that they're not going to do that and that's your perspective then you're probably not going to think this is a useful exercise similarly Vladimir Vladimirovich is consistently skeptical on the merits of any political agreements with the United States even legally binding ones rarely has he ever spoken about a demand for legally binding guarantees without 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 in the next few sentences all right decrying the fact that these actually have limited utility because U.S. assurances are worthless and the United States, according to him, uh, unilaterally exits international treaties and agreements of signs all the time. So they might not be that merit worthy either. So I'm just presenting a counter argument to my own thesis for you that that's that, they might not want to do that just because uh, they might not see that as delivering what they want. Uh, but it is to me probably the likeliest of the of the possibilities. OK. Uh, Bill Potter poses the question, um, the Russian military leadership, to what extent um, do they actually input into the decision, or are they simply going to be an implementer of um, Mr. Putin's uh, decision? Okay, so, you know, military leadership tries to inform and structure the options of the political leadership. So it provides an input to it, but it does not have a role in decision making. The way it affects decision making, right, is of course by trying to create some constraints in presenting, you know, the case of first, what is the art of the possible that this was they can do? What are their estimates about the likelihood of success? What are the costs they're likely to face, the, you know, let's say casualties and the like, and they use this to try to structure the thinking of political leadership but they are fundamentally much more of an implementer than the decider of anything. So whenever I hear anybody say, Gerasimov something, something, and that's what Russians think, I may say, no, that's what the chief of general staff of the Russian military thinks. Chief of general staff of the Russian military does not decide things. He doesn't set political strategy, and he doesn't decide on when to go to war or not go to war, right? So those, all those decisions lie at the senior political levels. Okay. Um, Mikhail Sipkin asks, you, you've sort of seen on the one hand, as you've described, the Russians taking or making efforts to cover uh, their deployments this time, but also doing things that would be noticed by the United States and NATO in, in terms of cranking the pressure. How do you see the calculation on that balance between, on the one hand, putting in place operational forces, but on the other hand, also using that to signal? So, you know, as I said early on, when you're engaged in this kind of large military deployment, you know it's going to be seen by the intelligence communities of the United States and, and a number of US allies, right? But you can do it in a way that, that actually really shapes the perceptions and raises a lot of questions and creates a great deal of uncertainty about what you all may tend to do. So are they signaling? Yes, they're genuinely signaling that uh, uh, that they may pursue a military technical solution, and the military technical solution can range from anything up to and including a large-scale military operation in Ukraine. That's true. I, I kind of have one issue with the coercive diplomacy narrative that's been bothering me from the very beginning, why I've been pessimistic from the outset. You know, they didn't make any demands in the spring. They issued red lines, but the spring buildup was very strange. The United States reacted to it and they forgot to make any of these demands back then. And that might actually might not have been a bad time to start issuing this kind of ultimatum. Instead, they engaged in a buildup and they didn't issue demands either. It was when the United States revealed that this military buildup was taking place and is different, and then began to reveal intelligence to US allies that Russia's leadership came out, acknowledged it vaguely, let's say, ambiguously, all right? 
and then stated that the Russian Ministry of Foreign Affairs should begin coming up with proposals and treaties. And so the entire diplomatic effort to me looked very improvised and very rushed. It was clear the Russian MFA typically had no idea until November 18 that they were actually supposed to be doing anything. You know? and, and so when I look at the story, I get very worried because what it feels like, and that's just one take, one hypothesis, is that they expected the fall buildup to be interpreted as another effort and in intimidation as the spring buildup. And that they may have been called out much earlier than they expected. And it led them to begin stalling for time and to come up with this diplomatic effort. And diplomatic effort consists of a number of non-starter proposals about revising the security architecture of Europe that they know we're not going to agree to. Okay, it's very clear. So, it's, it's, okay. it's, yeah. so I'm just painting this picture that I think is a bit more, I understand it's a cynical perspective, but I'm just saying that I don't know to what extent they were really intending to signal with it versus they actually were intending to sustain a military buildup and the diplomatic effort at some extent is a smoke screen. Okay, well, let me, let me pose the next question, which is uh, on Monday, um, Russian officials heard from their American counterparts uh, that their most outlandish demands were unlikely to be met. And they heard the same thing today at uh, NATO. So they presumably go back and they tell their boss, you know, we're not getting a NATO agreement to forswear enlargement. We're not getting a NATO agreement to pull military forces back from the new territories that only joined after, or the new states that joined only after 1997. And if Putin were to say on, say, Saturday after he meets with his folks, says, okay, go, how long would it take to sort of put those final preparations? I mean, what would be the minimum time? to put in place the remaining pieces that would be necessary for a major military operation? Um, this is a total guesstimate, let's yeah. say like uh, back of the knee calculations. Mm -hmm. uh, it would take uh, some weeks. So, but I will say weeks, not months. Okay. All right, uh, Christian Bruscard uh, asks, um, Putin is the decision maker, uh, but do you have a sense for who, where in the bureaucracy are the various political military options put together that are laid out before him, which would combine what the military says, this is what we can do here, our constraints, but also puts, you know, who puts that into the broader view of whatever political goals that the uh, Kremlin might hope to achieve? So the military, the general staff comes out with the actual options and the possibilities for operations, right? Mm -hmm. We already know based on everything we've seen that they've been told over the past year to make a military option viable, right? And not necessarily just one, but several. And we can discern that from our observations of the Russian military deployment, right? And we know where the military does that because the order to do it, to, be, to make use of force viable options. And a lot of what they've done really doesn't look like an effort just that coercion intimidation it generally looks like a military preparing for a large-scale military campaign so, all right beyond that these things are refereed at the russia's national security council right and and ultimately things like defense planning and other aspects are are decided there in conjunction of course with with the military I hope this kind of makes sense. Chris, you, it, Chris, in some ways, you probably know aspects of this, especially as it pertains to nuclear decision making, even better than me, right? But my point of view is that all the military options and everything they're going to do has already been discussed, okay? Has already been presented. That Putin's statement that, well, I'm going to see what, you know, my military analyst suggests to me. This is complete nonsense. That very likely he knows what the options are. They've already deliberated on them. They've already considered on them and he's going to pick among them. And, and worst case scenario, he already has chosen among them. He's already chosen one or the other in principle, right? And maybe not just committed, maybe he just hasn't committed to it. Okay. Uh, Mike McFall asks, so first of all, says fantastic talk, uh, asks if you could talk a bit more about the Ukrainian military, number of troops, number of battalion tactical groups, uh, you know, what kind of weaponry they have and, and have they taken steps in light of the Russian mobilization 
to deploy their forces towards uh, the uh, uh, border areas. Sorry, number of troops is hard because uh, Ukrainian military tries to keep as much as it can secret, just to be, just to be frank about that. It, it probably tries even harder than the Russian military attempts to keep its own uh, staff secret. So uh, I, I can paint maybe with a broad brush here that Ukraine has four deployed, I'm sorry, the Joint Force Operating Area, around 10 brigades. It rotates units through them. Most likely it is engaged in uh, a sort of beggar thy neighbor manning policy, having to pull units out of other brigades in order to fully staff the forward deployed. Ukrainian readiness, I've heard all sorts of ranging estimates in terms of the level of, of manning, maybe around 70% or so, okay? Um, that's a lot better, by the way, than the Russian led separatist forces, which I decrement typically at less than 50%. But we're not talking about that. We're talking about how they match up against the Russian military. In uh, terms of sort of size and structure, well, on paper, on paper, the numbers look pretty good, but I'll be frank, you don't know if they're real. A sizable percentage is conscripts without much military experience. You know, there's a lot of kind of talk that Ukraine's military is pardoned and fighting, has this experience from 2014, 2015. Well, I'm gonna have to, unfortunately, really caveat some of those sentiments. The first is that many people have fought in 2014 and 2015 have cycled out of the Ukrainian military long ago, all right? The second is that much of that fighting was has been positional warfare, and most of it has been indirect artillery skirmishes, sniper fire, and using anti-tank guided missiles, again, as a sniping technique, right? And cycling uh, platoons or companies to the line of control, to the trenches, and then moving them back. That is not what maneuver warfare looks like. And then the fighting was ever on a large scale in 2014, 2015. So Ukrainian armed forces at real experience in larger scale maneuver warfare is fairly minimal and warfare that involves air power and naval power realistically almost not, right? So in terms of facing an adversary that employs a combination of air power, land power, and sea power and life. Yeah, so those kind of my very, uh, I think very simplistic assessment of it um, about numbers, like I said, I. I have a sense of the numbers, but I am skeptical as to, as to whether they're true. And on paper, Ukraine often claims all, all sorts of numbers, and you don't know necessarily what's really behind that. The short answer, I think, is there is a consensus, both on this side of the Atlantic and within the Ukrainian military, that in the event of a large-scale military operation, while they would put up a fight, you know, they're not, their, their chances of being able to defend against the Russian military self-acknowledged are very slow. Okay. Uh, Tracy Wilson asks, um, how likely is it that, you know, instead of actually launching a military operation, uh, we might see in fact, then a redeployment of Russian forces or some Russian forces into Belarus where they would be permanently stationed. And of course, from that area then pose uh, a more northerly threat to uh, Ukraine. Okay, so I'm not sure I fully understand the question. The notion is that Russian forces would deploy into Belarus, which actually they're very likely to do um, either way, but then do what there? Pose a threat to Ukraine. They will do that uh, ahead of the military operation. I mean, if the, if, if the question is, you know, are Russian forces going to deploy in Belarus and stay there? Yeah, but that's neither neither here or there to any part of this discussion. Russian military can do that anytime. They don't need uh, to engage in course of diplomacy. They don't need to engage in high stakes gambits. They don't need to deploy 60 BTGs around Ukraine. They literally can deploy whatever force they want into Belarus whenever they want to based on their agreement with Lukashenko, right? So none of this is necessary for that. And if they did, nothing would happen. I Meaning there's nothing we can do about it and probably not a great deal would happen. So I, I, hope, I hope this answer kind of makes sense, but uh, on the likelihood that there's no military operation, that's, you know, that's anybody's guess. I laid out kind of my local case and 
where all the uncertainties lie. Okay. Would, uh, Michael, would you see any possibility that the, the Russians might incorporate some Belarusian units into this? I mean, do, do the Russians need those units if they wanted to have the political cover? Mm, the Belarusians unlikely. have units that would be capable of doing anything. In a very limited fashion, I think unlikely. Yeah. I think I think they need. I think that they could make good use of Belarusian territory as as a vector for um, several uh, acts of attack from the north, but they don't need Belarusian forces, and I'm deeply skeptical they would incorporate them. Okay. Um, there are some countries, including the United States, that are providing uh, Ukraine military assistance. If you were looking at the ledger from the Ukrainian military side. What are the sorts of things that they would need most now if, if the United States and other countries were to begin providing greater assistance uh, as they have threatened? Um, supplies, ammunition, and fairly simple, simple tactical capabilities that take very uh, limited amounts of training and can be readily integrated into the force. So this is usually uh, man portable systems like uh, uh, man, uh, man portable surface to air missiles, uh, anti tank missiles, and the like. Nothing advanced, nothing that requires extensive amount of training, nothing that can't be integrated into Ukrainian forces as is, or used or maintained by them. In fact, you're going to hurt them more than help them if you transfer anything like that. The US has an interesting track record of trying to help, uh, you know, partners, but giving them gear that actually isn't practical for them. It's costly to maintain, doesn't make any sense for the rest of their forces and so on and so forth. So be very, I say, be judicious in, in recommendations. And remember, there's a timeline for all this too, right? So whenever somebody says, uh, we should give them some advanced integrated air defenses, we say, yeah, the training time on that is a year. So it'll be very useful when it's far too late. All right. Um, any connection between Kazakhstan and the current mobilization around uh, around Ukraine. Does the deployment that the Russians uh, put in as part of the CTO so-called peacekeeping operation, does that affect their military ability any, in any way regarding Ukraine? Nope, it doesn't. And I actually think they're going to be out of Kazakhstan quite soon. But either way, even, even if they weren't out, even if they were to keep that deployment in Kazakhstan, it would not substantially affect uh, their, their military capacity to conduct an operation in Ukraine. OK. Ola Kasyanova asks, um, could you contrast how the kind of military operation that Russia might mount now uh, would differ from what we saw earlier in the Donbass, say, you know, in August of 2014, when the Russian military actually went in? Uh, in, in a, of course, in addition to the difference you've already described in terms of the difference of numbers of Russian forces. Okay, so there are kind of two different operations there. One was August, September 2014. Another one is the winter offensive of 2015. And in, in the August kind of fall of 2014, the Russian employment was a small number of battalion tactical groups backed with artillery and tactical multiple launch rocket systems. No use of air power, no use of long range fires, no use of precision strike systems and the like. So pretty limited and what they were doing was they were piecing together units from different parts of Russia, basically contract servicemen that they'd gotten um, to sign agreements to volunteer to go and fight and putting together different, different units in this way. They're actually cobbling together and also cycling a number of units to Ukraine later on, in a sense, intentionally to, to kind of bloody them. And those fights were pretty small. They were company battalion sized fights, but they're actually pretty small battles, just to be honest about it. Mm -hmm. The 2015 offensive was quite larger, it involved, uh, much, it involved a larger amount of mechanized and armored forces and artillery. Uh, it, however, was very similar to 2014. Again, it, they had a much larger operational deployment relative to the number of units they committed into the fight. And they used uh, very selectively, actually only once, long range rocket systems like cluster munitions just to signal to the Ukrainian military leadership that they had that capability to substantially escalate the fight. Uh, so how would this be different? Well, first, you know, the Russian military, at least the ground force, is fundamentally an artillery army with lots of tanks. It is a military that uses artillery firepower and strike systems to enable 
offensive maneuver by maneuver formations. The maneuver formations are mostly motor rifle battalions backed by uh, armor and the like. Okay, so this, you know, this hypothetical uh, conflict will involve a very large scale use of artillery, multiple launch rocket systems, long range systems that were never used in 14 and 15, uh, precision strike service to surface fires, Russian air power, and Russian rotor aviation. Not only does Russia have one of the largest uh, fixed wing air forces in the world, it also has one of the largest helicopter parks in the world, right? In terms of um, attack helicopters whose purpose is to support ground force formation. So the, you know, the kind of long story short is it would look very, very different. It would be not just a combined arms effort without restraint, but it would be a joint force operation and uh, it will involve a whole host of elements that were never seen in 2014, 2015. And remember the Russian air power, Russian airspace forces went through a tremendous evolution since 2015, especially resulting from their deployment in Syria. They rotated most of their air crews to Syria and they've also rotated almost all the senior military leadership through that campaign as well. Okay. A uh, question from Mark Kotz who asked, and, and you've talked about the various options uh, that the Russians could do in terms of territory. Uh, you reach out to Kyiv, Eastern Ukraine, a, a land bridge uh, to, um, to Crimea. You know, the idea that was being discussed back in 2014 of the so-called Novorossiya. If you had to bet, recognizing that we don't know, and it's a pretty murky question, would you predict any one is more of those options is more likely than the other in terms of the territory that the Russians might try to grab? Yeah. So, I mean, look, my personal bet is that they wouldn't want to grab territory. But I also think that they could end up holding it even if they didn't want to grab territory. Because a lot of times conflicts simply play out that way, right? That's kind of how we are where we are right now in 2022. If you look at the Russian operation to seize Crimea, there's very little to indicate that the, that the decision to annex it was predetermined. If you look at Russian uh, occupation of the Donbass, there's nothing to indicate that it was the Russian dream to permanently occupy half of Ukraine's Donbass and just hold on to it, right? They, they've ended up that way, but that doesn't appear to have ever been the goal, the sort of the political objective of use of force in either case. So if I was to pick amongst you know, these various scenarios, I think probably uh, Ukraine's Eastern regions is the most likely, right? Um, I think that some of the other ones are possible, Southern coast, that Northwestern vector to potentially encircle Kiev, but to me, the most likely are regions and territories east of the Dnieper River. Okay. Um, the crisis has been framed or in part in Moscow as a crisis between Russia and NATO, uh, and, and almost sometimes, I mean, if you look at these draft agreements, they're all about Russia and NATO, and, and Ukraine figures in is that the Russians demand that uh, NATO forever swear that Ukraine would never be a member. How do you see the political objectives uh, of the Russians in terms of Ukraine versus NATO? Is it about you know, more about Ukraine? Is it about both? Uh, how do you see the ultimate political goals? Well, they're interrelated, right? It's about it's about both. You have a specific conversation about Ukraine, right? And uh, the Russian desire to have a firm say over Ukraine's strategic orientation and uh, to compel, you know, basically uh, the Ukrainian government to, to a settlement that would secure Russian influence in Ukraine and Russia's say. Uh, or, or Ukraine's, uh, you know, basically have it in Russia's sphere of influence, you know, but that's just one aspect of the conversation because, you know, the bigger picture conversation, yes, is about obviously NATO enlargement. It's about uh, how NATO uh, works, cooperates in NATO military infrastructure, defense cooperation with non-NATO members, right? It's very much at that level. And the Russian discourse really changed on Ukraine a year ago from not just, you know, there's no NATO enlargement to Ukraine, but that NATO is de facto treating Ukraine as a NATO member and that NATO military infrastructure, defense cooperation, so on and so forth, arming of Ukraine training, that this also constitutes a red line, right? That's essentially Ukrainian territory is being used by the United States as an instrument against Russia. And then I think both of those observing understand that 
we are seeing and behind us an attempt to relitigate the post Cold War settlement, security architecture of Europe, how security outcomes are determined, and by whom, right? Implicitly behind the proposition, if you agree to constrain NATO enlargement, if you agree to negotiate NATO defense cooperation with non-NATO members with Russia on the basis of Russian security considerations, and if you agree to determine the security, the uh, strategic orientation of other states, uh, what you are agreeing to is that uh, security outcomes in Europe must be negotiated uh, with Russia, that joint decisions must be made with Russia across the board on all these things. Uh, Russian security and political preferences sort of predominate over the ability of other states uh, to, to make their own foreign policy choices, right? You're, this is so this kind of at that more big picture fundamental level, but I'm sure most folks kind of, I suspect, have similar observations. So we look at the political objectives. And, and to be honest, whether you think this is genuine or not, they've had a great go at the conversation. They spent three months plus setting the security agenda in Europe. I mean, it's all we've been talking about are Russian demands, the history of NATO enlargement, who promised what to whom, when, why, and what the future of NATO should be. How important is Ukraine to US interests? How important is Ukraine to European interests? It's been our entire conversation for the last three months. So whatever you may think of the Russian uh, diplomatic effort, I think you have to give them some credit. They've shown that they can actually put themselves at the top of the US foreign policy agenda and that they can set the security agenda in Europe, at least for some time. Okay. Um, Susan uh, Musalko asks, why is this happening now? Uh, I, I mean, you know, why, why is, Russia doing this now as opposed to say one or two years ago or say in 2023? All right, that's a good question. So I think probably the proximate events that take us here mostly transpire in 2020, right? Most are familiar that Zelensky takes a pretty hard turn uh, in 2020, shows that, you know, he doesn't have the political support to make big compromises. Uh, over Minsk negotiations, and he's essentially chosen another path, takes a hard line on Minsk, backed up by Europeans. He, you know, arrests Minsk troops, Putin's principal ally, seizes, you know, bans pro-Russian media. And what you have on, in the case of Ukraine specifically, between uh, 2020 and very early into 2021, you essentially have two clear realizations in Moscow, at least on Ukraine. The first is that, uh, whatever as, whatever um, uh, aspirations they may have had to reach a settlement with Zelensky, who looked like very promising because his entire agenda and platform was on negotiations, on compromise, and so on and so forth, were clearly gone, and it became obvious to them that there was going to be no political way forward on Minsk under Zelensky, and, and this is for a number of years, right? And he was probably the most promising uh, uh, Ukrainian interlocutor they could have had for quite some time. And the second was that on top of that, he would begin focusing on reducing and eliminating Russian influence in Ukraine, which I think was a red line for them. And then, you know, a couple of other things we could add from 2021. I'm just going to add two more of these on the board. You did see beginning of increased structural cooperation by NATO members with Ukraine, for example, the, the UK deal that, that was signed with Ukraine. And you had a buildup of well, not build up, but I would say you had really intensified military activity that was taking place in 2019, 2020, that Russians were complaining about for quite some time, that you still hear complaining about. But to me, probably the important thing from our side is, you know, we broached the conversation. Like, why now? We, we broached the conversation. The question put forward was, what would it take to attain predictability in this relationship to try to park Russia so we essentially could focus on other things? The US thesis was that perhaps we could do this with a limited strategic stability agenda and arms control. The proposition was essentially made from this side as an inquiry to see what the art of the possible was. And I think it was rightly made. And uh, as I commented at some point online, I think maybe early today is, you know, as Oscar Wilde said, there are two great tragedies in life. The first one's not getting what you want and the second one is getting it. So we have the answer from the Russian side of what it would take to make this a predictable relationship. They have laid out the price. It's very clear that this price is not one we're going to agree to. But beyond the proximate causes of you know, the events that have taken place in Ukraine, it's important to recognize we have been broaching a conversation with them 
about future of US-Russia relations, about what it would take to make the relationship more stable, more predictable. And they have answered us. And we may very much dislike the answer, but nonetheless, I think, I think we may have received it. Okay. Uh, let me take the next question is, uh, what role do you see for the Russian Navy? I mean, they, they have brought some units over from the uh, Caspian flotilla. Uh, what role might they play in a combined force operation? Uh, I think pretty limited, mostly to attain sea control. Um, most likely go after uh, uh, Ukraine, uh, what's, what amounts to the Ukrainian Navy. It's really a mosquito fleet and coastal facilities. And then there's, there's the real discussion on whether they would attempt uh, an amphibious operation. You know, the Russian Navy actually does the capacity for limited amphibious operations, significant enough that uh, they, they would pin down a number of Ukrainian forces to defend the southern coast. And Ukraine's sort of main commercially viable port is Odessa, right? And um, Odessa is a very important city in Ukraine, whether economically, culturally, politically, and, and so on. Mm -hmm. So can Russian naval infantry conduct an amphibious landing operation uh, somewhere northwest of Crimea and uh, near Odessa? The answer is yes, they can. It's an option. And, and then, and then you know, have the 58th Army come across Crimea and link up with them on a Western vector? Yes, they could. So the short answer, that's within the art of the possible. And the people who say that this is outlandish because they just haven't seen Russians do amphibious landing operations and whatnot, uh, that's wrong. The Russian Navy is capable of conducting limited amphibious operations, especially in the littorals that are barely, you know, a couple feet away from the naval base they're starting at, you know? So that's, it's, it's feasible. Okay. Uh, if uh, Mr. Putin decides to launch a major military operation in Ukraine, how do you think that will be seen by the Russian public? And let me ask a second question is how might that public reaction be changed if one result are in fact significant Russian casualties? I almost kind of want to duck the first one because that's a little bit anybody's guess, right? And I'm not an expert on Russian public attitudes and sentiments. My personal view is that uh, post-2018, there's never been a Russian public interest in, I'm sorry, by never I mean, there has not been a substantial Russian public interest in foreign adventurism or the deliverables of um, foreign military adventures. That said, and you could have seen the public mood change really around 2018 on the subject. That said, I don't know if the Russian public sees a military operation in Ukraine as an operation abroad akin to something like Syria or Nagorno-Karabakh or Kazakhstan. Second, I get the general sense the Russian elites are fairly ambivalent about this. Third, most of the conversation, and this is purely anecdotal, and of course I, I don't you know, I don't like do an to do analysis based on, you know, five conversations that I had with my friends around the kitchen in Moscow, right, which is like a particular strain of analysis in the Russia studies field. But based on what little bit of things you can glean anecdotally, uh, Russian elites are far less afraid of failure and much more afraid of success. So the, the real potential um, challenge they see is if Russia does have, the Russian leadership does have grand ambitions and intends to occupy some substantial part of Ukraine. Because I understand there will be Russian money that will then be used to invest in and develop this area. And they believe that the effort would set Russia back by quite a few years, right? That is, it would be so costly, even if there was no insurgency, no partisan warfare, none of these things. You've simply invaded and taken another part of a country, and now you must integrate that part of the country into your country or to support it, right, as, uh, as some puppet state. It costs money, and Russian elites understand where that money is going to come from, right? And the Russian public might also implicitly understand where that money is going to come from. On response to casualties, so my general sense to it is public aversion is grossly overstated. It all depends on whether or not you know, they believe that the operation is a success and results in a political victory. A lot depends on public perceptions of what the actual war. So it's hard to know, basically. I'm, I'm sorry, the, the unsatisfactory answer is it depends. Okay, great. Michael, we've uh, hit the uh, end of our time limit here. Uh, you have done yeoman's work first in a great presentation. I think you got through about 27 different questions. I apologize profusely to the 20 plus questions that I could not get to. 
I did try, let me say, to save some of the more political questions about, for example, the Russian agreements. And uh, for those of you on uh, next uh, Wednesday, we're going to have Rose Gottemuller and Jim Goldgeier to talk about the Russian proposed draft agreements, some of the political goals, and the Russian conversations that took place this week with American and with uh, NATO officials. Uh, so stay tuned. But uh, Michael, let me close by thanking you very much for taking the time to do this. I think you actually have left me with a much more granular feel for the military situation. And I think you've explained some things that are not uh, always clear when you just follow the newspaper accounts and appreciate your taking the time to do this. Yeah, thanks for the thanks for the kind invitations. Great talking to all of you. I see a lot of familiar faces in the attendee list and uh, I, hope, I, hope this was, I hope this was interesting for my colleagues and friends in the field. Oh, very useful and very interesting. Uh, again, apologies to those whose questions I could not get to. And at this point, Michael, if we were sitting in the Perry Conference room at Stanford, would I'll give you a warm round of applause. Uh, but let me give, give you a couple of claps on behalf of the uh, 135 people who are still with us. All right. Well, thanks a lot. It was, okay, it was great joining you, at least, at least this evening. Thank you. Take care now. Take care.